Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to another episode of the e-commerce marketing show. My guest today is Orion Brown, and she is the founder and CEO of Black Travel Box. Uh, and I just said, let's stop talking. We got to hit record because I want to hang out with you and have this conversation. So, uh, Orion, good to meet you and want to do just a quick intro and background on who you are for everybody. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. I, I really love kind of listening to the content and seeing the content you guys put out. So it's exciting to be here. Um, as you said, my name's Orion Brown. I'm the founder of the Black Travel Box. We're a personal care products company for travelers of color. Um, my background is actually pretty varied, but um, I came up in consumer goods marketing um, with the latest iteration of my career uh, on the food side. So uh, taking those skills and kind of bringing them to the beauty space is a unique and challenging opportunity for me, but um, I've been really having a lot of fun doing it. Okay, I want to I want to rewind back a little bit. So people want the tactics, and so they get mad when I do this, but, but I don't care. This is what I want to do, and I want to listen and hear your story. So, uh, so so your 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 background is like brand management, brand strategy by trade. Now that I know, okay, so you're at Kraft, so like literally the biggest food brand in the world doing brand management. Like what 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 did you do there? What was your experience? Um, so I came up on what would be considered sort of a, uh, the, the standard track of, of brand management going up through, through the ranks on a numerous businesses. And so I've worked on everything from Capri Sun, where we're marketing to very challengingly enough, both kids and adults, right? You need to get mom to actually pay for it and want to put down the cash, but you want the kids to actually be interested in it. And you have to be uh, um, for lack of a better term, moral about how you talk to kids. Um, you know, here's a shiny thing. Isn't necessarily the, the nicest way to go about doing those things. So um, that was a great consumer brand that I worked on. Maxwell House Coffee, I led long-term strategy for, did pricing strategy, all kinds of cool stuff, um, as well as led the A1, Grey Poupon, and Cool Whip brands for a time. So, I mean, it's, it's really fun. You get very fat. It just is. You, you, there's, the kitchens are right there. There's nothing you can do. Part of your job is to sample things. Um, and, uh, you know, I really built up with brand marketing in those businesses and within the way that Kraft does it, it's really a P&L management role. So you are a mini CEO of your business. So the smallest business that I worked on uh, as a part of my portfolio was a $30 million business. Um, and so in the largest was a billion dollar business, a global brand. So it's a, it's an interesting world and it's very different from entrepreneurship, especially when you're just starting out. It's interesting though, because so many of those things, like you've probably been, you've probably been like rooted, rooted in the found, like you're meant to be a CEO. Basically that was like your, your training ground to do what you're, what you're doing now. Yes, definitely in a way. I think it, it provided a really strong sort of strategic foundation. Um, but I will say, and I'm sure we'll get to it, uh, uh, the idea of like, what, what, did you, what do you have to unlearn? What do you have to kind of like get out of your head from being corporate? And frankly, it's, it was nice having an uncle with deep pockets that you could go to annually and say, this is my plan for next year. And this is what I want to go do. And I need more minions. Um, to go do this for me. So um, right. those are some of the unlearnings where you have to give yourself a little bit more patience and grace, because at least for me, I've learned that I actually have to learn the, the technicality of getting these things done, not just the why should we do them. A hundred percent. I mean, as somebody who's been like in the startup kind of tech world, what's interesting is like how you can really be hit or miss with hiring people from big, big companies, because like, the 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 key is to do what you said which is like all right it's great to have that framework like you've read the you know you read those books you know the playbook but can you unlearn it and then like re re like then tap into that muscle again when you might need it down the road okay i want to i want to dive into like i want to talk about your business because people people want to know about your background but they want to know about the business that you built the brand that you've built so when did you go and start like what was the founding story for the black travel box like because it always seems to be some moment with especially like okay now that i know your full background like you know great career in in in, in brand management you got it you got an mba at, at duke like you know my guess is this whole time you weren't thinking about this is the business that i'm going to start so like what what was the catalyst for for this whole this whole movement 
Oh yeah, no, I'm going to totally break the entrepreneur mold because I feel like every entrepreneur interview starts with. So since I was five, I've known that I wanted to be an entrepreneur and in the nursery at the hospital, I was selling nurses like, you know, hand embroidered masks and there's all these things. I, I didn't sell lemonade. I was, I was, I was born a hustler and, and you know, in, in second grade, I used to hustle, you know, baseball cards and okay. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And I was like, no, I read a lot. Full stop. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I wasn't that kid. I wasn't that kid in high school. I wasn't that kid in college. I, I love, God bless corporations and their biweekly paychecks and really good insurance. Um, those, are, those are things that I appreciate very much. Um, but for me, the impetus for the company and actually the impetus for becoming sort of a full-time entrepreneur was sort of parallel path. So the business itself, um, I just had an issue. Like, it, and I'm, now that is in the, within the mold of an entrepreneur, right? You hear a lot, well, it came from my own challenge and then I th thought I'd start a company. Um, for me, it came from my own challenge over 15 years being in the corporate space. Um, two things that I loved about corporate, besides my work, was vacation time and pay. <laughs> so pay me and then let me take that time off and go spend this money. And that's what I did. Um, that was my self care. And it was a really important part of my life and my balance. Um, because I, I, I'm a hard worker. I've always been. And so um, as I would travel, I was on my 16th, 17th country. And I'm like, I, every time I go somewhere, I have an issue, whether it's running out of product, whether it's not finding the right things. It's definitely not finding the right things. I have been on the continent of Africa twice. And I still have not purchased hair and skincare products for myself there because the markets really are oriented towards European settlers, travelers, all of that. And so it was a frustration point that finally, I, you know, the funny part of the story is I was in Japan. I planned for Okinawa weather. We went, to, or I planned for, for Osaka weather. We stopped in Okinawa and I went full tilt frizz. And I was like, I don't have enough product to help me. I can't take any more photos. I'm like, I'm going to take pictures of everybody else while I'm here. I will not be in these photos. And so I thought, you know, what if there was a brand that actually knew that I exist in the world and actually created something to make this not suck for me? Um, and that was the impetus. And it started as a passion project. I wasn't planning on doing it full time. I was doing it in between stuff as I was working. Um, technically, I cornered myself by making an LLC. I literally did it on purpose. I incorporated the company to make sure that I would actually work on it. Um, <laughs> why, why, why did, is there some like legal, like are you tied to that in, in some way? Like what is that actually? Um, I think some of it's a little bit psychological, but it's just having skin in the game. It was like, I paid money, I Got paid it. name to it. It exists in the world. I have to like, I have a tax ID, which means the government knows I exist now. It's like a thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that's, like a, that's a real like psychological thing. I, I'm obsessed with like social psychology and in, in the book Influence by Robert Cialdini he talks about like, yes. it's called commitment and consistency. And there's, there's a whole study like if you, it's why like if you declare on Facebook, like I'm going to work out five times this week. Exactly. Because now you've said to the world, I am this person who does this. So like for yes. you, in your case, you're like, I am entrepreneur. Uh oh, yes. <laughs> like I got to actually go do this. And this, this business is legit. I mean, once you're a corporate entity, once you're an entity, um, whether you're a, a limited liability corporation or otherwise, you, I mean, you, you, you die and pay taxes just like, all, like regular people do. <laughs> and I think that that was, that was a motivation factor for me because that trip in, to Japan was in May. I didn't incorporate until August and I spent the whole summer not working on this idea that I thought I should be working on. And so, I mean, even with that, you know, the holidays came and went and I was kind of like thinking about it in the back of my mind. So I kind of floundered a little bit. And then really 2018 was the year that I was in sort of that parallel transition. So with Black Travel Box, I started talking to customers or potential customers and saying, am I the only person that has this issue? This is the idea that I have. What do you think about it? I did some surveys. Like, so I started to do, I always start with consumer insights because why not? <laughs> You That's know, the brand management in you. It is the brand management in me because at the end of the day, like one big, big lesson that I learned is, you know, often in brand management, you don't get the luxury of being the customer. Like you really don't get the luxury of being that consumer. You don't get the luxury, you know, men sell tampons all the time. It's fine. 
they're good at I, women sell tires, whatever. That's so sexist, but you get the idea. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, you kind of have to keep in mind that even if you think you are the consumer, and, and I have really created this business around me as a consumer and saying, how do I amplify and scale up me by reaching an audience of me's out there? Um, but I first wanted to really gut test and pressure test. Like, am I truly a unique snowflake that no one else exists like me? Or are there other people? And so I spent that year kind of doing that work, that legwork, as well as um, building the brand aesthetic and, and those other things. And in tandem, I had had my fill of corporate, just like over time. I was like, I don't want you to pay me anymore. Stop, please. Just, just stop. It's okay. I'm just going to go. <laughs> uh, I, lo I love it because I think you you talked about like i think empathy is the most underrated skill in marketing and like a lot of us say that we have it like i listen to customers but like you know you took it another step you're like i i am the customer a but even still that's not enough i need to go get data points from other people because they might everybody kind of talks differently or has a different language or you know yeah. see things differently and so to get those data points so like all right what i think for for our audience like the thing that people are most interested in is like is the actual marketing side so like fast forward a little bit the the part that we don't talk a lot about which is like kind of the, the crux of a, of having a great brand is like having a product that people want so like okay you you, you went through that whole podcast we, that could be somebody else's podcast but like you know I'm, I'm on your site right now it's amazing you got products you got social proof you you know we'll, we'll talk about beyonce and all this other stuff but like now do you when was like when was the launch did did you did you do a big launch was it a was it like a, a slow drip or just all of a sudden did this happen like what what was the actual launch to now period like i would i would call it a runny nose launch if we were to say a drip <laughs> it was Good. a runny nose launch um because it so there's a few things uh, when you talk about the brand piece the brand was actually the first thing i established right so as i'm doing that consumer insight work and kind of saying like is there a reason for this to be i was also in the background going i know exactly what i want it to look like <laughs> and like going in to get that done and working with an amazing designer i found on upwork and like figuring out what does the aesthetic what is the aesthetic of this brand because at the end of the day the stuff that's in the jar the stuff that's in the bar um this isn't rocket science. It's just that people aren't doing it. And secondarily to that, you know, at the end of the day, that means it's not insulated. So what do we really stand for? What is it that we're actually creating in the world? And so all the visuals and stuff. Now I'll, I will tell you, I am the butcher baker and candlestick maker on this business for the most part. So like I built the website, but it was also Shopify. So when I say I built it, I made it pretty. Um, you know. Did you write, did you write the copy, be, be ready, be present, be you, clean beauty essentials on the go for travelers of color? Yeah, yeah. And I've, over time, I've brought on um, different consultants and different aspects to help me flesh out some of those things. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I could try to do it all, like truly do it all. I would never sleep and you don't want me sleepy. Like hangry and sleepy are not two things you want to see. <laughs> right. But, but somebody's doing it, you're outsourcing the work, but you're like probably still waist deep in it. Like you're, you care about the message and the copy. Oh yeah. 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 And I've been AB testing all that copy. So the cap copy you see now started out with working with somebody, getting some suggestions, tweaking it, playing with it, and then putting it on the site using tools like crazy egg to AB test and see what people actually are reacting to. What, Okay, so how do you think about from from a marketing perspective? And I have your site up right now. Like, yeah. how do you think about how do you think about marketing? Like, what what purpose does your Shopify store have? And like, what do you want people to do? Yeah, I mean, so so our store is the entree into the brand. So the way that I think about this, and just to give you a little bit of background, and sort of the I have a phased approach of how I'm bringing the brand to market. Um, a lot of people go, I want to start a brand tomorrow, and then by Tuesday, I want to be in Target. And God bless Target, it is very expensive to get into. You have to produce all the product to get in there. You need to make sure your product is moving. And companies like the Crafts of the World are spending millions of dollars that you're not even aware of to not only get the shelf placement, but to make sure that the pricing is so low that you can't resist it, so it turns those are not things that are typically healthy for a smaller business, particularly if you don't have the marketing infrastructure in place, the machine, mm. the millions to put in to drive 
massive amounts of aware awareness to get it turning at shelf because it takes a lot. I mean, it's people think about this like I, I find it hilarious to me and also sad <laughs> that our political process is really similar in the sense that you can buy votes. The more you have to spend, this is why they build so much in their coffers is because the more attention you can buy from Americans or individuals, the more likely they're going to convert, i.e. vote. And so it's people vote with their money all the time. And so for me, retail is like our last tranche, right? Once we've built up that cult following and the best way to reach exactly who you want to reach is to be digital. And so I'm trying and I'm still working it out, but I'm trying to tell my story. I'm trying to tell our brand story and create engagement and create a community around it by starting out with our website. And I, I can tell you, as we speak, there are things being planned and revamp. <laughs> there are, there's copy, there's lists of things that need to be tested and played around with. Um, because I think we've all had the moment, if you've ever sent an email to somebody and you're like, here's what's going on. All right, cool, you're good? And the person's like, yeah. And then later you find out they had no idea what you were talking about. That happens, I feel like, with copy and with websites. People are like, oh yeah, I get what you're saying. But unless you really test it with where their dollars are going or talking to them, you'll never know if they're taking away the message that you want them to and if that resonates. Got it. So, so like when you're, when you're running tests, like what are you looking for? Because I think A-B testing is something that comes up a lot. And I think and it's a, really lot big. Of <laughs> a lot of people are obsessed with it for kind of the wrong reasons. Like, yeah. oh, I really want to test like, you know, and we, we'll get this question a lot even at Privy, like, can I do A-B testing? And it's kind of like, Yes, but but why? And so I'm just yeah. like I, I want to hear it in your words about like what do you what are you actually looking for and and like how give me maybe if you have an example of like something you've learned and a change that you've yeah. made. Definitely, definitely. So um, we can talk about that tagline and and that initial copy and above the fold, right, yeah. on our website blacktravelbox.com. You should go check it out. That's plug. terrible. I had to. I had to plug it. Oh, um, I'm so, gonna. I, I'm shamelessly plugging you the whole way. This is already like this is part of the whole process. Like, if the only I promise you that if the only way that people found out about your business was like at this part of the interview, we would have a problem. We're, we're, <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, you know, so, so that section has had different tagline and headers. Um, it's had different, um, um, so many different iterations of the actual descriptive copy because ultimately, so here's what I want to happen. You see us somewhere, you might see us on social media. Um, you might see me on something. You might hear me on a podcast. You might be a friend of a friend that somebody mentioned it to. So you're like, I kind of get it. It's some like body products. And I think it's for like people who are black. I don't know. Like, it's okay. Like our brains don't take all the pieces together. So what I need to do is very, very quickly when you get to the site, make sure you understand at least what our products are and like what our sort of high order benefit is. Like, what is it that you're, you're giving me? And so there's a lot of different ways to say that. So when I A-B test it, there's a few things that I want to happen. One, I want to give them a story. And it doesn't have to be a complete story. It could just be the highlights. Like, you know, I used to love reading Cliff Notes in high school because God, that book was long, you know, that kind of thing. And so we want those Cliff Notes there, but I also want to make sure that as you go through the funnel, and I'm not talking like click funnels and all of that stuff, as you go through the process of being a customer, right? So I get to the site, I kind of know what you're about. Now you tell me what you're about. If I click on a product page, if I click on an About Us page, if I click anywhere else on the site, I want to make sure that it's consistent. So the yeah. first thing, usually people are going for clicks, right? Or whatever with A-B with A-B testing, they're like, I want to see a conversion. For me, I'm like, one, is this story compelling enough for you to go on and do something else on the site? Because this, the homepage doesn't do everything. We don't have like one of those singular page, endless scrolling Mario Brothers type pages where you're just doing... You just one page nowhere else to go and so I want you to go to other places because that means that you're engaged and you will likely purchase because uh, you can't actually purchase on that page ha ah, look at that and so can I make it compelling enough for you to move forward but not only that things can be compelling for the wrong reasons right hey you can win a million dollars psych now you're pissed off <laughs> so no one wants to see that oh go ahead Dave yeah I think like <clears throat> 
when we talk about, so, so my background is not in e-commerce. And so like what, what's fun about my role as CMO here is like the fun part about doing this podcast is I'm actually interviewing you just cause I'm, I'm curious and I want to try to get answers out for our, for our audience. Right. But like yeah. one thing that comes up a lot that I've heard is like people asking about conversion rate and benchmarks for conversion rate. And the example that you just said is perfect because it's like, well, <clears throat> conversion rate, I don't know. There isn't a good benchmark because like every, everything is different. If I have a, if I have an ad that says click here and I'll give you $500 right now and it's verified and guaranteed, like the conversion rate on that ad is going to be through the roof. And so you can't look at it just in that one thing. And I think the part you mentioned that's really important is to be able to like lay out the full funnel and think about if somebody sees this ad and then goes to this part of my site and then clicks through to this explore the collection page and then they go to the cloth performance mask and then they either check out or they don't like that's the whole like funnel experience that that that's where the magic really happens not just like tweaking one thing here exactly exactly and and the thing is is when people talk about funnels and you know they make it more complicated than it needs to be so even to your point about the numbers like the numbers are sort of arbitrary because at the end of the day it's like do you have a sustainable funnel when i say sustainable i don't care if you're converting at half a percent or at 20 percent like if 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 you're converting at 20 percent, but it costs you millions of dollars in all your time to get that those conversions like in like you're only you you only have five people interested in you, and so if two or three of them uh, convert, well, we have a great conversion rate. Yeah, but it's only five people, and how much revenue are you getting on that? So it just has to be sustainable. Yeah. And I think one of the things people miss is, you know, I'm in beauty companies like Sephora that sell online. I guarantee their conversion rates are like abysmal because they they drive so much traffic, right? They have so much money to drive traffic, so the conversion rate looks abysmal and sort of like the the grand scheme of things. So I say all that to say, keep it simple and then really think about what their experience is. You don't want to bait and switch. That's an old school, like 1930s, put one thing in the window and then have it inside at a different price at a different size and all of that. Right. And so if you can do that, people like you more because you don't suck. <laughs> they like you as a person, as a brand person. How do you, how do you do that? Like, maybe this is like a Shopify setup thing, but like, how, how do you do that with so many different products? Cause like, is, mm -hmm. is it crazy to have to think about like, cause like your collection page, I don't know, there's probably 20 products on here. I don't know how many you have. Mm -hmm. how, how do you think about each one of those? Cause each one of those products could be its own funnel and experience. Like, is there, is there a way to think about that overall? So like how, yeah. how do you keep that simple? Yeah, I, I think there's a couple things. And, and like, I, I'm, I'm not a guru by any stretch, but what I would say is if you're starting out with your brand foundations, your brand foundations are your, your brand mission, your values, your ethos, um, how, what your philosophy, your product philosophy is, especially if you're a manufacturer. If you're not a manufacturer, your job shipper is a little bit different, but even still, you could still say, everything we have is fluffy and soft and wonderful. And if it doesn't induce a coma, we don't sell it. Like that is a great, which by the way, I saw an ad that said coma inducer for like these blankets. And I was like, that is the best piece of marketing I've seen in a very long time. Great. Um, but if you, so if you have that in place, everything you do, like when you're, if you're getting a secondary person to do your copy or you're doing it yourself, your brief should say, this is what we believe. And it should permeate everything that you're doing. And then it's just about execution, right? Like, so again, is fluffy the right word? Or is tufted the right word? Is my, you know, is my customer more elegant and they want to feel like it's special and velvet? Or do they want to just, you know, it's so fluffy. Like that's the kind of communication they need. Yeah. And then you apply that to everything. And so while I do see brands and um, gurus kind of say, well, each product should have its own funnel and it should do this. And like, it kind of does it. It's almost a rubber stamping if your brand stands for the same thing, if your product ethos is the same thing, and there's a natural reason why you have that product on the site. So when you go to do the copy, when you go to do um, you know, the, the videos and all of that stuff, you have like sort of an inherent consistency to it. All right, so now I'm on your product pages yes. and your, your product pages are like a masterclass in, in marketing. And so you have oh, like- gosh. <laughs> Thanks. Like, not only do you have all of the, like, I'm looking at the body bomb and hair bomb right now. Like, not only can you flip through and, and see it all, but then you have this, like, 
you have the description, right? And it's not just like, you know, like someone actually, probably you, or I don't know, who knows? I don't know what layer, but like someone has thought about every word on these description pages, right? Like yes, if there was, was a magic, great. like how good is this? Slay all day with this convenient essentials bundle designed to keep your hair and skin looking great on the go. If there was a magic wand for looking good while not catching a case at TSA, this would be it. This bundle gives your hair and skin the moisture and nourishment it needs to tackle any challenge. And that that's just like, three sentences in the whole description. Then you have, you have all the ingredients, like four paragraphs listed out. You have a whole thing about an FAQ about shipping and like, you know, answering all these questions. What's the cost? Where do you ship? And then about us, like reinforcing all the stuff that you had on your homepage now here as seen in Black Enterprise, Essence, Forbes, Travel and Noir, like I mean, and then you go down here, reviews, right? Here, here, this, is a, this is a review from uh, Raquel H. Nothing less than amazing. Like this is, this is a masterclass. How, how, did, it, did it take you a while to get to this or did you know this is what our product pages have to do? Well, I mean, it's been iterative and I will say um, the unfortunate K-hole of being <laughs> an entrepreneur is sometimes getting an analysis paralysis and being like, oh, I could change it again. Oh, I could change it again. Oh, I could change it again. Um, but I would say the three elements that created that page was one, stealing shamelessly, not stealing copy because that's illegal, stealing structure, very legal. So okay, so who, give me a brand, like, because there's got to be a brand that you modeled this after. Who's the brand that oh, you Oh, yeah, I mean, like several for? brands. I mean, I, when I tell you, I take screenshots like crazy. I had to turn off that little sound, that little camera clicker sound, because it just makes me sound like a total weirdo. All day, click, click, click. Any website, I, I mean, I started out with the Sephora's of the world because they, so the, the product page to me is now your store. That's your true store. Like the front, the, you know, that's the window dressing is that homepage. This is the true store. If I go into a store, I hate sales, the people popping up and, and I kind of want to just like interact with stuff. But I thought about, well, what is my process when I buy these types of products? What are the things that I want to know? And who does that well? So I looked at the Sephora's and the Ulta's of the world. And then even like the brands, I would look, I would do a quick comparison and you can do this in any category. So go to the retailer that really kicks butt. I think we're not swearing here. So that no, kicks, say it, say it, you have to say <laughs> that, it. Now. That kicks ass. Yeah. Um, go to the retailer that kicks ass, particularly the e-com space. Look at their website, look at how they're selling the products. Are they doing different things based on category, not doing that? And then look at the brands that are leading brands and go to their website and see how they're doing in commerce. What do they believe is important to, to communicate? And so I, I have to say, I've cobbled a lot of things together. Like I have a folder of hundreds of screenshots where I've literally circled the thing like, oh, I like that thing. I don't like that thing. Um, and that's actually something I learned from brand management because working with agencies, people, don't, uh, people are not psychic. They cannot read your mind. So you go, I want something pretty. Pretty is not a descriptive, right? So I've gotten into the habit of creating mood boards for everything. And my mood boards are just screenshots or photos of things that I like. And I typically will say, you know, aesthetically, these are the places I want to go. And then here are the things that I hate. Let's X those off. We're not going to use them. And here are the things that I think we should be using. And that's how that kind of structure came about. Every marketer needs, needs a swipe file and that, that's your swipe file, your mood board. Okay, tactically, because people want to know this. What do you actually, where do you actually keep those mood boards? What is it? Oh, I, I just literally, had, there's no fancy, uh, there's two places that they will show up. One is just a folder on my desktop that is marked website. Nice. So these are all website ideas. When I'm doing something on my website, I'm like, instead of me figuring out and starting from scratch how I want to do it, let me go through my website folder and see if there's anything that applies. And then the second place is my Trello because Trello is where I actually do my project management and kind of keeps me on track. I will use, once I say, oh, I really love that they had this tab scroll down thing on the page. I don't have time to do that right now. Let me take the picture of that, throw it in Trello. That's my project for next week. I'm going to work on it. Love it. All right, so, so we've talked to, we've talked to about your your site. Um, what are what are the kind of like what are you doing from a marketing standpoint? Like, are you you know do you have some cadence of like we send out a weekly email, we do a monthly offer? Like, I want to try to tell people about like you know because you have this great brand, this great site, but as you know, just yeah. because you built it doesn't mean people are going to come. And so like what what's the like you know what are you doing from an ads perspective? How are you actually driving sales? Yes, yes. So I have been. 
a fair weather friend to Facebook ads. Um, my biggest challenge, and just to be transparent, is I cannot stand ads manager. And I, I cannot stand the idea of paying somebody to do ads manager for me because it's like, it's one of those things you should never be paying a person more, number one, than what you're actually spending. So if you want to just do some tests and like kind of throw a few hundred bucks out there, a thousand bucks here or there, don't hire somebody to do that. But by the same token, know thyself. And if you hate touching ads manager, don't be like me. Um, but I've, I've, so I've done tests periodically. What I would say is, um, only a fraction of our customers have come from ads. Our primary traffic is coming from social, um, Instagram, some Facebook, but Instagram is sort of our hub because this, the psychology behind it is where our customers are. What's your, what's your Instagram? I'm going to pull it up. Black Travel. It's at Black Travel Box. Okay. Yeah. And so with that, you know, so if we look at our customers, then this is why it's really important to do that customer stuff up front, that consumer research up front. They're going into Facebook to talk about trips and to plan the practicalities of trips. And they're going into Instagram to get in inspiration. Sometimes inspiration comes from Facebook because people are sharing their pictures and stuff there. But there's these massive groups, massive, massive groups on Facebook, hundreds of thousands of people getting together to talk about travel. Um, and so for us, it's Instagram is the primary because when you're inspired, you're excited. And when you're excited, you start buying stuff for it. Right. It, and Facebook is sort of the place where we have the more deeper conversations, um, and kind of learn more that I do all my consumer insights work on Facebook. Cause if you go and sit like for us, travel, black travel is our space. If I just go sit in a black travel group and see what people are talking about. I have everything I ever needed to know. It's, it's amazing. That's like the most, that's the most amazing thing. Even like for me trying to get up to speed on e-commerce over the last like six to eight months, I've just got joined groups with like, you know, store owners. We're, we're like, you're hanging out online and that's where we get the best ideas for content. That's how we got the idea for this podcast and like what to focus on. And so I love that because I think everybody has a niche, like your focus is like black travel, right? perfect niche like that that's that's really that's clearly defined mm -hmm. and and like i think just people don't think about enough like just reverse engineering like where do my people hang out where are yeah. they spending time online and like you're not in there trying to sell you're literally like hanging while you're sitting on the couch watching tv you're you're hanging out with all of your dream customers who are sharing in their own words exactly the problems that you can help solve free focus groups I have paid I can, hundreds of thousands of dollars in the corporate setting to get half the information that I get here. Because focus groups are weird. It's like, it's a bunch of people who don't know each other, staring at each other at a table, they're uncomfortable, they're hungry, and they're wondering when you're gonna give them their $75 Amazon gift card. Exactly. And, exactly. But, but you want people in their element. You want people in their underwear being like, I wanna go to Aruba, how do I do that? And this was my last trip and here are photos the crazy things that you can learn from people. I'm actually working with like the, the Microsoft Azure people to figure out a way. Um, and this is, I don't know, it's, I don't think it's secret or anything, but they do like AI that does like screen scraping and all that. So I was like, how do we take that and then apply that to all these travel photos that people are sharing? So I can look at what, how they do their hair, whether they have like what colors they wear when they travel, like, cause there's just so much data. You could yeah. do so much with so much data. You could figure out like which, which cool brand, like, you know, you could partner with a fashion brand or sunglasses. Like there's so many exactly. things. Or drop our own sunglasses as a bonus, you yeah. know, and say, you know, gift with purchase, these shades that look just like the 50,000 other shades that, that everybody wants to travel with. So, um, so like, are, are you, do you like, when you take that stuff, are you, are you doing like, Hey, we're going to come up with an offer. Like we, we want to try to drive some sales like next week, we're going to come up with an offer and that, that that's going to be a new, new ad creative. Like, are you doing stuff like that? Yeah. I mean, so that would, I would say that's a part of my innovation budget. I don't know if one can have an innovation budget and be this small, but like, um, but that's sort of the next level, next gen of the business. Because for me, while we sell hair and skincare, I think the brand has legs much broader, right? So, um, you know, we're sort of away meets Glossier for black travel, but that encompasses experience, that encompasses bonuses, that encompasses all these other things. If I look at a picture, if I look at a picture of like a hundred different travelers, right? And I find that they wear their hair similarly and they like the same colors. 
I can do things like not only offer products, but you know, we don't even have to product, um, you know, proliferate. We could just get into the place of, well, every time I have an ad, I need to show people that look like they're dressed that way, right? If most of my travelers are, I mean, one of my, my ethos in terms of like advertising is, is we are accessible, um, but still elevated. So I'm never gonna have a supermodel on one of our ads. I'm never gonna have a supermodel on our pages. These needs to look like real humans, right? And then the real humans that I show should look like the humans that want to purchase me. And then by the way, when you're on that product page thinking about buying and I see like real reviews from real humans, like all those things connect. Yeah, like on your, on your, so I was gonna ask you who all of your like, company you know product photography and people like are these all shoots that you've done are they are they models that like are, are friends like how do you get all this content like i'm looking at <laughs> a, who is this this is uh someone's in someone's in cuba with a big hat like who are these people <laughs> um those are our stock people um but the so the way that you make that i think you there's the practicality of just not paying people for shoots, right? So like big companies can send people to Cuba or Aruba or anything else that begins with an, or ends with an A and shoot these amazing photo shoots and then just use them like a few times in a campaign. We don't actually have that luxury right now. We will, we will, we will. Um, and so what I do is, again, when I talked about briefing earlier, briefs are so important. Even if you're doing work yourself, it helps you focus in on the thing that you want. So being clear about the look and feel of, of even stock photos gives you that consistency where people can go, wow, how'd you get all those product shoots done? You know, all those photo shoots done. And then some of it, you know, you'll see our videos are real people. Those are people that either people I know or people who have tried the product and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, like those banner images and stuff, we didn't shoot them. Yeah, and I, but I think, I think that, that, that just tells that you have like taste though, because I think like a lot of people will try to use stock photos and it's like you know like someone in business clothing and a handshake you know <laughs> this guy right here it's the Justin's pose where your elbows are way higher than your shoulders and no one's edge should ever be in that direction like yeah this is yeah. great all right so i want to ask you about the best campaign you've ever run uh yes. and we'll do that in a second but first before we get there just last couple of thoughts on marketing are there you know things you've learned about marketing along the way, things you wish you did um, that you could give to, you know, take, take yourself back maybe three or four years. And like, I got, you know, I got, I got a store going, I got, you know, 22,000 in sales and I'm starting to feel really good. Um, you know, what do I need to do? What are the marketing things that, that really work for you? Um, I'm going to use this as a shameless plug to go back to your question about emailing because um, I never answer it. And this is actually a big, huge aha for me. So um, I would say that I Columbus, you know, I discovered email <laughs> last spring. Um, I was like, this is so amazing. Other people should do it. Duh. Um, wait, wait, wait. What, 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 was, what was holding you back? Like why, uh, what, what, was it something that was holding you back? Or you just never got to it. It was slightly never got to, you know, the first thing I did was, oh, I need a welcome sequence. I know I need a welcome sequence. So I had the welcome sequence in place and I had it doing different things, but I was also on that other, you know, monkey platform. And um, there just wasn't, there wasn't enough stimuli to really get me digging in and playing around with it, playing around with segmentation, playing around with like how I reach people, behavioral based stuff. And so I was just sort of like, oh, welcome sequence. Like, let's, this is a minimum viable product. It's all good, which is good. It really is. If you're just starting out, minimum viable product at, at, across your email is great, right? Like, you just want to see what works and what doesn't. Um, but at the point that I was like, what if we just kind of did like some funnels or something? Like, what if we did some flows? What would a flow look like? And I just started piece by piece because, again, there's only so many hours of the day and a lot of the stuff I'm doing myself. And it's interesting. There's not a lot of email experts out there that, you know, can, that can come in, come in and do email flows and like help you kind of think through that without costing you. Honestly, people want like tens of thousands of dollars to do it now. And if you're just starting out, it's like, that's just not, that doesn't make a ton of sense to do. So I just kind of took it piecemeal and to your point of like, where are we at now? light years away from where I started. So we started out with a welcome sequence. Today, I think we have, 
I'm going to say there's more than a dozen ish flows to some extent. Some of the flows are tagging. So I do have some that are just there to do certain things based off of behavioral actions, which I really like. So like, you know, Playview allows you to tag and change and update information about um, individual customers or even visitors, depending on if, if they're known. And so even being able to use that, not even to send them something, but just to have gathered information is really helpful. But I've got all the abandoned carts, back in stocks, browse abandonment. So we've got tons of flows. And then from a campaign perspective, this is where I'm still a little green and we're continuing to build on it. We do try to do one to two touch points a week. I want that closer to probably three to five. Um, but it's also, I'm trying to be mindful because again, I put my consumer hat on. How many times do I get an email in a week? Um, and then at what point do I get so annoyed that I just go ahead and throw them in spam? Yeah. And so it's, if you don't have a huge list and our list has grown considerably since our, our lovely friend Beyonce has uh, graced us with her presence. Um, if your list isn't massive, you want to be careful about too much touch points because you really will be talking to the same people all the time, especially if they're really engaged. Your first few customers are like, this is new, this is cool, I want to read everything you open. Well, they have great open rates, but they can't buy from you 12, 12 times a week. I love, um, your, I love your email approach because I think I've heard a lot of people get stuck at this stage, <laughs> which is like, I want to do email, but I don't know what to send. And I want to send really creative newsletters and like, you actually flipped it and you said, let's set up all of the automation first, right? Abandoned cart, uh, yeah. what, you know, um, whatever, all the other like kind of automated, those are like the always Sunset. on yeah. campaigns that are going to run for you. Now it's easy to add the one or two once a month things that you can do. And it gives you, at least you're like recovering revenue and sales and generating that. And that's kind of like happening in your sleep now. Yes, and you, I think you hit the nail on the head. As much as I can give you a long, drawn-out explanation, I was lazy, and it was easier. Because <laughs> if you have these flows going, and if you, even if you just add an email to like your early stage sequence once every month or two, just have it in there, you're always, I mean, people are going to be in that sequence. If you, the way ours is set up, it's, you know, they're getting a, uh, an email more frequently at the beginning and a little bit more spread out towards the end of that, that flow. Um, but they're covered for like six weeks. That's six weeks of work I don't have to do for every person that I bring in. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, it's, it's a great, <laughs> it's a great lazy factor, but it keeps you in contact and constant contact with your customers without requiring you to come up some, with something new and juicy every week and, and chat with them. Love it. I was sending a, a message to, to the marketing team about that. Cause I think that's the that's the, e that's the email framework that we want to, we want to like help teach, which is like, don't like, look, newsletters are great. We want you to tell your brand story, please. I got two newsletters out and then I just fell off. I couldn't do it. <laughs> but first, you know, uh, <clears throat> do you know what, do you know what like the, do you know what like your add to cart rate is on your site? Are those like metrics that you know? Yeah. Um, off the top of my head, I think our latest add to cart was around uh, three, seven. So that, so like out of, so that means out of a hundred people that come 3.7 people add it to yeah. the cart, got it. So, yeah. I mean, that's, and that fluctuates, like it goes up as our, I mean, this is the math of it. The denominator comes down. So as people who are already engaged with us, as our return customer rate is higher then that, that, that add to cart goes up. Um, it floats down when we get things like open PR. So we got PR where thousands of people who just were like, Beyonce said, go here. And then they looked and they were like, oh, I didn't know what it was because she didn't really tell them what it was. It's okay. She didn't have the story for us there. And so then they go, oh, okay, never mind. They look around, uh, but we pixeled them, so they'll be back. Um, so that'll, that'll fluctuate. If you're doing advertising well, um, I, honestly, your top funnel should be pretty wide and you'll see those, if your ad to cart starts to drop, it may not necessarily be that you suck. <laughs> it just might be that more people know you that aren't necessarily qualified. Yeah. I mean, your, your Beyonce example is exactly like the Sephora site that you mentioned, right? Like you're just going to drive a ton of traffic in there. Okay. So this is going to be what, what, uh, is the Beyonce thing you're going to, is that what you're going to talk about for best campaign ever? No, cause it wasn't a campaign. It wasn't a campaign. No. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk about something different. Okay. All right. Let's, let's, I'm excited then. Okay. Go. Um, so, and, and, I'm just actually taking a look into my campaigns now to keep myself honest on the numbers, but um, I did 
So we did a campaign uh, recently. We wanted to do a sale. Uh, wait, is it there? Is it there? Is it there? Yeah. Okay. So, so we wanted, so I wanted to, you know, as everything started to go sideways with COVID, everybody had to sneeze and it was just like a problem and nobody wants to travel and you should not travel. It, like don't travel to buy our products, just buy our products and keep it for the next time you travel or just use it at home. Um, I was trying to figure out like, do I do a sale? Do I run like something really big? Um, you know, do I need to do a blowout? Do I need to do Christmas in July? But it was really March at the time I was thinking about it. What do, what do, what do I need to do? And it kind of occurred to me and I, to just, I'm like, I have a community of people that actually have uh, skin in the game around our business, right? We're a fighter brand. We're, we're out here going uphill, trying to get investors, going uphill, trying to get awareness trying to get everything done. I get notes from people all the time that, you know, heard me on like Gimlet Media is the pitch. And they're like, I don't understand why they didn't invest in you, but when you start shipping to Norway, please let me know like <laughs> that you're, what you're doing is great. And I'm in the like widest, most like, you know, the least racially diverse place. And I don't know where to find things that work for me. And I'll take your two ounce jar because I love and believe in what you're doing, um, which is, you know, it gets you a little choked up. And so I thought, you know, why don't I send a, just a note? I'm just gonna send an email. So when you talk about like people having issues with like, well, how do I make this beautiful newsletter and all that? I literally just sent an email from me. So it was the from address, was from Orion, you know, my email. Well, it was, it was our, our customer service email because it'll screw up the livability, but you get the idea, right? And I'm like, hey, stuff is rough. And actually I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you how I worded it. But basically I said, you know, this, this shit is happening it's hard in these streets was the campaign name <laughs> and then i no, 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 around. No, no, I, I want to know so 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 hard hard in these streets was the campaign name where like this is in clavio yeah yeah so i'm just popping it open but like if so one was this shutdown is no joke as a subject line right and then um the other one was it's complicated it's complicated was actually the one that won um and we had something like 40 percent open rate and you know, that campaign probably did 3x any other campaign in terms of sales. Because what, what, I was, was, what was in the email? Like, is it, a, is it like, was it like a promo? It, no, it was, uh, we might have to make some hard choices soon because y'all ain't traveling and I understand. I get it. It's fine. We're all freaked out. However, you know, we've had post, I mean, I just, it was an open letter. It was a vulnerable letter that just basically said, you know, the last year has been rough enough being a small business or starting out and running a startup and trying to yeah. do all these things. And you guys have been so supportive through all of the ups and downs. And now we're getting hit hard. Um, so if you ever considered purchasing from us, and this was not like the high open rate group. I don't think we went to our big active segment on this. This really was, I was like, I casted a wide net and, and just said, if you've ever considered purchasing for us, would you consider doing it today? Um, That's awesome. You know, you, know, you, know, most, you know how most other brands would send that email? Due to the challenging times presented by these unprecedented COVID <laughs> circumstances, like, you know, that, that, that sounds like that was you, re literally, like that's you reaching out to, to your audience. Yeah, it's, and it's being authentic about it. Like there's, I, I would say that there's, you know, if I had to talk about the structure, it was very clear header of, um, this isn't a good time for us as a business, right? And then giving a little bit of background of where we've been, what we've been through and what we've come from. I talk about like their engagement. It's not a super long email. It just, it's a lot of one-liners. And then it's like, you know, if you, if you thought about purchasing from us, could you do it? And here's a couple things that you might want. Like if you're sitting at home, Ashley, <laughs> and you can't go to the beach and you don't want to like show off your glossy thighs just yet, just, just gloss them at home. Love and Mother's it. Day is coming up. So like give mom stuff. She loves gift sets. She'll make her feel special. But like whatever it might be, here's a couple ideas. I did actually put a promo in it, but it's not like a big 15% off kind of crazy thing. It was just like a, by the way, you know, for your support, I'm running a special for friends and family because we're close. We've just established a level of vulnerability that some of my exes haven't gotten. So what... <laughs> You know, here's a little 15% off if you want to use it. Most people didn't even use the promo. They really didn't even use the code. 
That was a great dig. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I mean, and, and I thought this, I mean, I got notes back from people because they replied back like, keep going sister and like all kinds of stuff. So I actually yeah. got physical responses to this note, um, even though I didn't probably, actually put a prompt to it. Um, and I just thought that was really cool. There's probably people that didn't even buy, but just like you sending that message was like, yes, this is the brand. I'm glad to be on your email list. Like this is the brand, a brand that I want to be a part of. Yeah. All right. So that's, that's the best campaign. Oh, that's go ahead. The best campaign. Go, you go. Best campaign. No, that was the best campaign you ever, you ever sent. Yes, I'm, yes, I'm trying to, yes. I'm to add a bow on this for YouTube. <laughs> um, okay, since we have two minutes though, can you yes. tell me more? Can you tell me more about the Beyonce thing? Like, how did it happen? The, the grace of God. Um, so basically, oh, for over Juneteenth weekend, for Juneteenth, she released um, her Black Parade album, and as a as a part of that, as a part of her foundation and other things that she does, she created essentially a, a directory of black owned businesses in a number of categories. Um, miracle from on high. I have no idea. She had, she had someone curate and um, they, they curated some businesses and I ended up in, I didn't even actually believe I was on there. Somebody messaged us. We got DMs about it and I thought it was one of those like, you know, I'm a Zamundan prince, send me $5,000. Here's, you know, what's your social security number kind of thing. Cause those even happen on business accounts. Like don't let these people tell you that this doesn't happen everywhere. Um, and so I, I was like, I'm not clicking on that link. What are you crazy? And then I started getting text messages from people I know and they were like, no, really you're on, you're on her website. And so I'm really grateful for, for them. And um, I think the, the group that, that curated that was like black owned everything. But um, yeah, it was, it was really cool. We were like, my face is on Beyonce's website, which is weird. I was like, oh God, okay, that's what we're doing now. Um, <laughs> and um, they did post our Instagram, not our website. Note to the wise, get your website as the first click, not necessarily your Instagram, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you have a celebrity endorsement. Um, but it did have a really great boost to our Instagram as well as we did see a bump in our, uh, website, the biggest piece. And this is where, you know, if the endorsement itself isn't perfect, that's okay because you can still leverage it. So one of the, the thing that I did the next day after I just like ran through the streets naked, like <laughs> Beyonce knows my name <laughs> and she knows what I look like. This is crazy. Um, the next day was laying out a list of um, relevancy-based publications, media, who were actually talking about buying from Black businesses. So I had my VA go out. Everybody that spoke about, like, everybody that had, like, a, here's 15 Black businesses, and this is what you should be doing, and there's this movement. We sent them a note. In particular, I'm in Colorado, so I was like, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm the only business from Colorado on her list. So we're definitely doing all the local media and being like, this is your one claim to frame, fame. Beyonce knows your estate now. Um, and we went out and, we, and we're still pitching people based off of that. We're using it as a proof point. We're going to influencers who were kind of flaky. Let's, I mean, no names named, but you know, you send them notes, they may or may not get back to you. Send them product, they may or may not get back to you. So being able to say, hey, by the way, you do know that uh, the queen knows us. You sure you don't want to put that body bomb on? That's, that's what we've been doing. It's literally the best social proof and stamp that you could have as a oh, business. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. I, that, that whole thing that you just said is amazing though. That I just want to like replay that for people because that, that is like how I know that you're a marketing machine, like to not just be like, Oh, cool. Cause I think a lot of people be like, this is awesome. And you kind of bask in it for a while. You tell all your friends, but like you immediately took action on two things. Number one, you updated your website and as seen in Beyonce is now in your social proof banner everywhere. But like the whole play to go deeper and then go to all the local press through your VA is like, that's, that's, ne that, that's next level. That might be too advanced for this podcast. That's amazing. <laughs> Well, Orion, right. this was this was awesome. You're you're an you're an awesome entrepreneur. Uh, I'm pumped to get to talk to you. Probably this is one of my favorite episodes we've done because I think we we've got a nice groove of tactical and uh, you know you you know your stuff and and that's awesome. So if you haven't done it already, go and check out theblacktravelbox.com. Also, Black Travel Box on Instagram, so you can go and see like. And I would actually just pull up the website because I think this is a perfect example. Look, if you're, if you have a Shopify store, if you're a small and growing e-commerce brand, like 
uh, to Orion's point about like finding examples to swipe and copy. This is a, a perfect brand. And we, we, we talked to a lot of like, you know, cosmetic skincare, health and beauty brands. This would be a perfect template to go and copy. So um, it's awesome. And, and people should go and copy all your stuff. Yeah. Steal shamelessly. As long as it's not the copy, I'm good with it. <laughs> all right. Thanks for doing it. We'll talk to everybody later. Orion, nice to meet you. Uh, go leave us the review if you like this episode and we'll talk to you later.